The Bible speaks about repentance. So does Deuteronomy. However, the way it speaks about this central theme in the Christian faith is often overlooked in comparison with our general understanding of repentance as individual Christians. Welcome to yet another tidbit from the Bible. I'm Dr. Paul Peterson, and our topic this particular quarter, the last of 2021, is themes from Deuteronomy. And as you probably have observed today, this week, we look at repentance. So let's read a couple of the texts from Deuteronomy that speak about repentance. We find one example in the first of the sermons or speeches by Moses in chapter 4, another one in chapter 30. Chapter 4 in Deuteronomy, Moses in this first of his uh, speeches closed with an ominous prediction. Verse 27 taking for granted that the people will sin, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. And only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. Reading from New International Version. But if you, from there, seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your forefathers, which he confirmed to them by all. So, the people will rebel and then finally one day will enter captivity, be scattered among the nations. In the last of the sermons in chapter 29 and 30, Paul, uh, Moses describes the uh, blessings and the curses. And on the curses is this scattering among the people. But, verse 1 in chapter 30, When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. And this expression uh, is using the same Hebrew roots sh from shub to return, teshuva, uh, repentance or returning. And the Lord your God will have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Now notice, in this appeal to repentance, Moses certainly speaks to you, but he speaks to the people that are to come generations down the line. He's not speaking about individual repentance. He's, he's speaking about corporate corporate repentance and conversion. You and your sons, that is your descendants. Many years later, the great King Solomon dedicated the temple. In 1 Kings 8, he's offering a wonderful prayer and in that prayer he appeals to the people to turn to God with the eyes turned towards the temple in Jerusalem, realizing that God really lives in heaven and from his heavenly sanctuary, he will answer them. And, and Solomon imagines 
seven different circumstances where the people will have to turn to the Lord. And he is inspired by the curses and the blessings in Deuteronomy. He actually explicitly mentions Moses in this long prayer that happens uh, in the latter part of the prayer, particularly in verse 56. But listen to this last of the seven situations from verse 46 in 1 Kings 8. When they sin against you, they, the people, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to the enemy, who takes them captive to his own land, far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead, that is, in Hebrew, if they turn, they have a return of heart, conversion. And they say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly, and if they turn back to you with all their heart, and soul in the land of their enemies. Then, verse 49, hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, and forgive your people. When Daniel was in exile, he prayed, according to chapter 9, a, a mighty prayer. And that particular prayer was such a covenant prayer realizing that the people were in exile because of their corporate sins and realizing that if they returned to God while in exile and prayed such a prayer, the Lord might hear them. So, what is then the relationship between the individual anger, uh, uh, the individual sin and anger towards God and God's anger and the individual or corporate Repentance. Daniel himself was actually innocent in the sense that he had not been rebellious. He and his friends ended up in captivity in Babylon as innocent victims of the corporate sin. So, that the people has corporately sinned does not mean that any individual, every individual had. But they would be hit as well. It goes the other way, doesn't it? When you look at the blessings and curses in Deuteronomy, you may easily read them as modern Westerners do, from our perspective, as if they speak about my individual fate. I just have to to read a, a book the other day uh, with a wonderful title Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes by Randolph Riches and Brandon O'Brien. It should be an eye-opener for many people. And one of the ways we as Westerners read the Bible with and misread it is if we impose upon Bible individual individuality where the Bible speaks corporately. So many people read a, a, an evangelical read a message of personal success into the text from Deuteronomy. But when the text speaks about the blessings, if you follow, it speaks corporately. Just as Daniel was innocent and still a victim of the sins of the people, so individuals may be blessed by the corporate obedience. And your personal obedience does not automatically result in success in life. You can become ill even if you live healthy. You may be poor even you, though you're doing well. We're not saved by success. The blessings that you and I experience when we individually repent our sins, those blessings come primarily in forgiveness, in peace with God, in help towards being merciful towards other people and thus follow 
the laws of God. Now, one last reflection. Is then Deuteronomy not legalistic? No, because you're not saved by being obedient. These are blessings to the people as such. And remember, as we've spoken about many times, in Deuteronomy, it is strongly emphasized that the initiator for the covenant is God. His love for the people under said law is the foundation of the giving of the law. Next, these promises about listening to the prayers when you are taken captive are given long beforehand. So these are promises of mercy so that when you remember them, you know God is merciful. He knew it would happen. Let me then close this tidbit by a strange text, maybe uh, fairly unknown to many, from Lamentations. How often do we read Lamentations? Chapter 5, the last chapter, close with this, closes with this uh, sentence in verse 21. We store us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Here there is a play on the various forms of the verb to repent or return, shub. The first occurrence, translated here with restore us to yourself, is a hefi, that's a causative, indicating that the beginning of the restoration that makes us turn to God comes from God himself. You and I do not turn back to God and repent because of our own initiative. It's because God seeks out us and speaks to us. His Spirit is turning our minds to him so that we can really turn to God. Thank you for listening to this tidbit from themes from Deuteronomy and welcome back as we continue that for next week.